I began my career further afield than Steve did. He began in this room. I began my career 420 paces north of this room. I measured it this morning. And it was in the uh, Botanical Museum classroom of Richard Evan Schultes, the father of the science of ethnobotany. I had dropped out of college, was working at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. They're very careful about making uh, that, that distinction. Uh, as a gopher, moving dinosaur bones and reptile specimens from one side of the museum to the other. And a friend of mine said, there's this crazy old Harvard professor who went down to the Amazon in 1941 for six months, and he kind of went missing for 14 years. And if he takes, he's giving his course at night, you should take it. Well, I opened the course catalog, and there was a course on the botany and chemistry of hallucinogenic plants. <laughs> so this had a certain appeal at the time. <laughs> So I enrolled in that class. And I'm sure there's people in this classroom beside myself who saw Dr. Schulte's very famous lecture on the plant hallucinogens of the Northwest Amazon. He was a spectacular photographer, at least as good as Ansel Adams, and working under much more difficult conditions. So he turned out the lights and began working his magic. And he showed slide after slide after slide of these naked Indians doing these bizarre dances under the influence of these very powerful plants. And it was one image that set me on my career path 35 years ago. It was a picture of three Indians in bark cloth masks and grass skirts. And Schulte said, and I quote, here you see three Indians of the Yukuna tribe. They're doing the Kayari dance to keep away the forces of darkness. All of them are totally intoxicated on a highly hallucinogenic potion made from the ayahuasca liana. He said, the one on the left has a Harvard degree. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> well, that image got me hooked. Hooked on plants, hooked on Indians, and hooked on the Amazon. And 30 some odd years later, I'm still at it. Now, I want to tie my talk into something that Alexandra mentioned repeatedly, and that's the interconnectedness of what we do. Because when I got into this business 30 years ago, working for the World Wildlife Fund, I remember approaching a potential donor to try and raise some money, and they said, and I quote, who gives a shit about the rainforest? We have to worry about zero population growth. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to somebody in the media to pitch them on a story on rainforest conservation, and they said, who cares about rainforest? We have to care about climate change. <laughs> well, of course, there's the interconnectedness of all things. Because what's destroying the rainforest? The lack of zero population growth. And what's the major, major, major cause of climate change? Forest destruction. If everybody in the US of A and everybody in China and everybody in Russia stopped driving cars right now and got on their bicycles, the climate would still be changing because forest destruction puts more bad stuff in the atmosphere. So what does the protection of the Amazon have to do with climate change? Everything. But so does nuclear war, and so does coral reef protection and everything else. I'm from New Orleans. I understand climate change. I didn't grow up at sea level. I grew up nine feet below sea level. Okay, so I gave the keynote address at an environmental symposium, the first big environmental symposium in New Orleans after Katrina. And I listened to these people gas on for three days about wetlands. And I said, here's the bad news. It doesn't make any damn difference. If you regrow every wetland at the mouth of the Mississippi, if the Amazon is cut down and the polar ice caps melt and the oceans rise, because you're all screwed. <laughs> so the point here being, is you can't just worry about little kids in the inner city or AIDS or climate change or all this other stuff unless somebody's addressing all the other stuff because it all connects. It all connects. And one of the radical uh, theories on, on which we work at the Amazon Conservation Team, where I serve, is that if you want to protect rainforests, you have to protect people. Because 5% of the Amazon is in national parks. That's not much and it's badly protected. 25% of the Amazon is indigenous lands, where you have Indians, you have rainforest, you have rainforest, you have Indians. It's not mutually exclusive. So our focus is what we call biocultural conservation, using people to protect the environment, using the environment to protect people. It's all interconnected. So the bottom line here is, if you're going to talk about sustainability, you got to think about it in a holistic way. You can't just think about Fortress America. You can't just think about middle, upper class, well-educated Harvard graduates, because we know since 9-11, what happens overseas impacts us as well. So we got to be thinking big picture here. 
wetlands in Louisiana, coral reefs in the Caribbean, rainforests in the Amazon, old growth forests here in New England. That little bit that survived the wood cutting and what survived the hurricane in 1928, it's still there. And every piece of virgin forest on this planet needs to be seen as something sacred and something which is sacrificed and cut down and destroyed and degraded. We all pay a very real price. Thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, Professor Plotkin, you're not off the hook yet. <laughs> you're, you're, you're wearing something here. Uh, when you have a successful event in the Northeast Amazon, where I spent much of my career working, uh, two things happen. Uh, your face is painted red, your body's painted blue, and necklaces are tied on. And so the yellow necklace that I wear was tied on by a great shaman of the Trio tribe by the name of Amashina. Now this man did not tell me he was a shaman for the first 22 years we worked together. And when I asked him, when he revealed it, why he didn't tell me, he said, well, I don't know, I guess I was just kind of pulling your leg. So I don't know about you guys, but I've never played a practical joke where it took over two decades to deliver the punchline. <coughs> but as he tied the necklace on me, he told me a story about the first white man he'd ever met, which was just a couple of decades ago. He said he was a wildlife trader, and he had a gun, and he said, I'd heard of guns, but I'd never seen one. And he showed me how to shoot it. And I said, I want one. Can I have yours? And he said, well, you know what? You really know the forest. Could you run out and catch me some sekrapatu, some forest tortoises? And he said, sure. So he said, I went out and I got him a bunch of tortoises and gave it to him. And I said, now can I have the gun? He goes, well, could you go out and get me some snakes? Because they, they uh, generate a good return. So he says, I went out for a couple of days and caught a bunch of snakes, which isn't easy to do in the rainforest. And then I said, now can I have the gun? He says, well, get me some, some of those forest uh, seed-eating finches. And he said, I went to the savanna. It's full of bugs. I got all bitten up, and I got into the birds. And I said, now can I have my gun? He says, well, you know, I really want you to catch me some bats. And the shaman stopped, and he smiled, and he said, he's dead now. So I haven't taken the necklace off.